Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. By the end of the 19th century, the westward expeditions of Othniel Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope had produced some truly spectacular results. Some of the most famous dinosaurs of all time, including Triceratops, Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus, were formally described by the pair, with wagon loads of fossils being transported to East Coast museums for study. However, as noted in the previous video in this series, these discoveries did not necessarily trickle out of academia and into wider society at large. For the most part, dinosaurs and their remains were not really accessible by the public, with museums often acting as storehouses where fossils could be studied by well-to-do gentleman paleontologists. When fossil material was put on display, these often consisted of isolated bones and fragments, giving little indication as to the overall size and appearance of the animals in question. In addition, after the perceived failure and inadequacy of the Crystal Palace dinosaur display in London, few such elaborate examples of public outreach were attempted again by 19th century paleontologists. Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins attempted to replicate the initial fanfare surrounding his English dinosaur sculptures by planning to open a museum in Central Park, but his plans were thwarted by local corrupt politicians. Marsh and Cope did not commission any great works of art to commemorate their findings, aside from producing skeletal drawings, with the two men more interested in competing with each other than educating the public. However, by the 1890s, museum operators had begun to view dinosaurs as star attractions, bringing in greater publicity, fame, and, most importantly, investment. Henry Fairfield Osborne was installed as the Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York in 1891, where he placed great effort in developing numerous displays, dioramas, and paintings in order to popularise his department. These efforts would lead to the first reasonably complete dinosaur specimens being put on display to the public, drawing in millions of visitors during his tenure, with other museums taking note and copying these trends. Osborne would hire zoological artist Charles R. Knight to produce eye-catching and grand depictions of dinosaurs and other extinct animals, which would go on display at the museum, proving wildly popular and influential. Knight has been hailed as one of the great popularizers of the prehistoric past, and as having influenced generations of museum-goers. Examples of Knight's work frequently appeared in dinosaur books published in the US during the first half of the 20th century, and countless other artists and illustrators borrowed heavily from Knight's conception of dinosaurs. Because Knight worked in an era when new and often fragmentary fossils were coming out of the American West, not all of his creations were based on solid evidence, and often deviated from the preserved remains that were available to him. Even at the time, many curators argued that his work was more artistic than scientific, and protested that he did not have sufficient scientific expertise to render prehistoric animals as precisely as he did. His dinosaur paintings, produced in a period that stretched from the 1890s to 1951, truly are works of art, full of colour, mood and impressive lighting. Landscapes in these works comprise lush, swampy forests, often with a distant, erupting volcano present in the far background, suggesting an unstable primordial world, both full of life, but haunted by the spectre of death and disaster. Knight's dinosaurs themselves are often heavy-set, ponderous beasts, with splayed, lizard-like limbs and dragging tails. In his 1897 depiction of the mighty Brontosaurus, the animals in question are shown wading through a swamp, with the implication being that the dinosaurs were simply too heavy to support their own weight on land. As with all of Knight's dinosaurs, the brontosaurs are depicted with dull, scaly skin, in this case being a dark olive-green colour, clearly drawing inspiration from crocodiles and alligators. These attributes would be widely copied by future artists, setting the standard for how the general public would view the so-called terrible lizards for generations. As was typical for the time, Knight held extinct animals in low regard, describing them as slow-moving dunces that were unadaptable and unprogressive in nature. This opinion was held by his employer and supervisor, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was a staunch advocate of the view that life on Earth inevitably became better and more advanced with time. In the great tree of life, reptiles, and therefore dinosaurs, were inherently inferior to mammals, 
with his museum exhibits arranged to impart this message to visitors. Somewhat unsurprisingly, Osborne was also a fanatical supporter of eugenics, being of the opinion that human races were biologically distinct and possessed inherent characteristics. In such a scheme, Osborne located so-called Nordic Europeans as the pinnacle of life on Earth above all other beings. Although such views were common among the upper echelons of European and North American societies during the rampant colonialism of the 19th and first half of the 20th century, Osborne's intense interest in the subject was considered extreme even by the standards of the time. His attempts to inject eugenicist themes into the museum's exhibits caused controversy, with Osborne's arrogant and detestable personality not helping matters. He rejected Darwinian evolution, preferring his own theories of progress, with some of his later writings going on to inspire Adolf Hitler. Despite putting so much effort into popularising dinosaurs, Osborne inevitably saw the extinct Saurians as pathetic failures. Despite their seemingly awesome size and power, they were simply too slow and stupid to survive, with the supposedly superior mammals pushing them into extinction. Even Osborne's most famous legacy, Tyrannosaurus rex, was not immune from this treatment. Despite being uncovered by one of his well-funded expeditions to Montana in 1905 and advertised to great fanfare, even being dubbed the prize fighter of antiquity, Osborne regarded the beast as a noble failure, with its 1915 exhibit emphasising the fact that T-Rex left no descendants. In truth, there has always been something of the carnivalesque regarding the presentation of dinosaurs, as if audiences were being advertised to roll up, roll up, come and see the giant extinct monster for the low, low price of one nickel. In regard to Osborne's horrible personal views, dinosaurs were like impressive members of the freak shows that were common forms of entertainment at the time, like the Circus Strongman, Bearded Lady, or Joseph Merrick, the so-called Elephant Man. Intriguing, perhaps, but with aspects that were also pitiable and frightening to Victorian-era audiences. It is also not surprising that dinosaurs came to be associated with the colonial possessions and peoples ruled over by European imperial powers. As Knight and Osborne were working to popularise the terrible lizards, and as new specimens were being dug up by Marsh and Cope, the so-called scramble for Africa was underway, with European powers competing to carve up the continent to extract its natural resources. The heavily forested regions of the Congo were among the last to be fully explored by Europeans, with the entire continent viewed as being inherently backward and primitive, essentially representing an environment in which little had changed since the Mesozoic. Such views are completely at odds with reality, given that tropical rainforests are a development of the Cenozoic, and Africa has produced many extremely successful modern animals, such as elephants, bovid antelopes, cavimorph rodents, and of course, humans. Nonetheless, European explorers and big game hunters saw Africa as the Dark Continent, with its interior potentially inhabited by surviving dinosaurs such as the cryptid Mokele Mbembe. The earliest reports of such mystery animals appear in writing at the turn of the 20th century, conveniently coinciding with the dinosaur boom that saw Diplodocus and Brontosaurus come to light. Indeed, descriptions of the Mokele and Bembe closely resemble Knight's Brontosaurus, being a flabby-bodied, sluggish swamp dweller, a viewpoint that was highly influential at the time and persists in descriptions of the cryptid to this day. However, one of Knight's other early dinosaur paintings would go against the prevailing wisdom of fat-bodied, lumpish saurians. In the 1897 painting titled Laylapse, depicting the Tyrannosauroid now known as Dryptosaurus, Knight shows the animals in battle, with one individual leaping athletically through the air. Both animals are taut, muscular and lean, being one of the first examples of dinosaurs in paleo art to be shown as active and dynamic anticipating elements of the dinosaur renaissance that would begin in the late 1960s. The stage was set for the great beasts to make their mark in the world of popular culture, especially in the rapidly evolving world of cinema. Dinosaur subjects on the silver screen go back almost as far as movie making itself. Very early on, filmmakers caught on to the notion that, somehow, it should be possible to replicate extinct animals in the world of the movie theatre and that a public hungry for the exotic and novel would be willing to pay for it, 
effectively cashing in on the dinosaur mania running rampant at the time. Unfortunately, the very early history of prehistoric cinema is lost to us. The first of these films is a now lost short, Prehistoric Man, of which next to nothing is known. This was joined in 1905 by Prehistoric Peeps, based on a cartoon series by E.T. Reed for the English periodical Punch. The humour of Prehistoric Peeps was derived from exactly the same types of sources as the later Flintstones, seeing modern habits and conveniences transported to the antediluvian world of cavemen. This film adaptation of Prehistoric Peeps is a more straightforward example of science fiction, as a scientist falls asleep and dreams he is being chased around by saurian monsters and buxom cave women before being woken in his laboratory by his assistant. None of the dinosaurs that appear in the film are representative of real extinct species, being simply made up generic reptilian creatures portrayed very cheaply by people in costumes. In the same year that Arthur Conan Doyle's novel The Lost World was published, Hollywood director and scumbag extraordinaire D.W. Griffith, responsible for the birth of a nation and intolerance, tried his hand at dinosaurs and cavemen. 1912's Man's Genesis focused on the hapless weak hands who attempt to woo his love interest Lily White from the crude brute force. The 10-minute Man's Genesis was largely recycled in 1914 for the film Brute Force. The story of Weak Hand's discovery of the club is repeated and then expanded upon when he becomes the head of the tribe, thanks to his technological prowess. Fending off dinosaurs of various types, from lizards in glued-on frills to life-size papier-mâché models, he also defends the women from the tribe of the villainous Monkey Walk. However, Monkey Walk's tribe also discovers the club, equalising the prehistoric political landscape. This half-hour film was the longest dinosaur feature until the first full-length film, The Lost World in 1925, and has the honour of being the first time in which a relatively realistic dinosaur appeared in a live-action film, with a very stationary Ceratosaurus menacing weak hands and his tribe. Also in 1914, the theatre-going public were introduced to Gertie the Dinosaur, the star of Windsor McKay's groundbreaking animated short of the same name. Originally part of a vaudeville act produced by McKay, the lovable and charismatic Gertie was the first animated cartoon personality, predating the likes of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, Betty Boop and Mickey Mouse. In the film, Gertie does tricks much like a trained elephant. She's animated in a naturalistic style unprecedented for the time. She breathes rhythmically, she shifts her weight as she moves, and her abdominal muscles undulate as she drinks water. McKay imbued her with a personality. While friendly, she could also be mischievous, ignoring or rebelling against her master's commands. In 1915, a young dimensional animator by the name of Willis O'Brien broke onto the scene with a comedy short entitled The Dinosaur and the Missing Link. The original version of The Missing Link was a relatively crude test reel, which O'Brien created to experiment with and sell the technique of stop-motion animation to producers. Thomas Edison bought it, and commissioned O'Brien to produce a proper version of his comic film. Notably, this updated version would depict the titular Missing Link as a large, hulking ape, a type of character that would later go on to be his most famous creation in the 1930s. This series of comedy shorts led to a serious dinosaur film when Herbert Dawley hired O'Brien to animate his 1919 film The Ghost of Slumber Mountain. O'Brien stayed in touch with the famous fossil hunter Barnum Brown to ensure the accuracy of his dinosaur models, which added up to a full 45 minute film in which a man came upon the cabin of an eccentric paleontologist. The ghost of this paleontologist, who may have been played by O'Brien as well, exhorts the man to look through his special binoculars, which look deep into the past when Saurians ruled the Earth. The dinosaurs featured here are impressive and menacing, far more so than any earlier project, featuring a battle between a Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops, a trope that would have a long history in dinosaur media. Despite their realism, these were still monstrous lumbering beasts that did little more than fight and eat. However, O'Brien's big break would come when he helmed the special effects for the dinosaur-heavy 1925 film The Lost World, an adaptation of Arthur Conan Doyle's famous novel of the same name. 
First published in 1912, at the height of early 20th century dinomania, the novel charts an expedition to a remote high plateau in South America, where dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals have managed to survive into modern times. The incredibly British members of the expedition have many dangerous encounters with prehistoric beasts, including nasty, almost demon-like pterosaurs, and two of the most famous English dinosaurs, Iguanodon and Megalosaurus. Speaking of which, the terrible lizards are presented as more of an inconvenience to the progress of Professor Challenger and friends. The herd of Iguanodon encountered by the group are described as looking like monstrous kangaroos, 20 feet in length, and with skins like black crocodiles. They are slow-witted, inoffensive brutes that wouldn't hurt a fly, being an early example of the trope in which herbivorous dinosaurs are portrayed as being gentle giants. The toad-faced Megalosaurus, or what is an Allosaurus, the characters are not quite sure, is more threatening and attempts to eat the protagonists twice. However, its main method of killing its prey appears to be a belly flop rather than simply running it down and biting with its sharp teeth. This makes the theropod seem rather clumsy and ineffective as a predator, reminding the audience that dinosaurs were pitiful failures in the evolutionary race. Indeed, the non-mammalian inhabitants of the plateau are presented as being grotesque, stupid monsters that act as impediments to the so-called civilization represented by the British expedition. The indigenous humans of this locale are also presented as being welcoming and grateful to the explorers, making them potential good future subjects of the British Empire. In the end, Challenger and friends succeed in capturing a live pterosaur and transport it back to London, where it escapes and runs amok around the city. The characters plot a return to the plateau after they find it probably rich in diamonds, which has uncomfortable parallels with the South African diamond mining operations of Cecil Rhodes. The 1925 film was a fairly loose adaptation, following the broad narrative structure of the novel while making many changes, which is particularly notable with regard to the dinosaurs, which have a far more American feel to them. For inspiration, O'Brien and his assistant Marcel Delgado went straight to the paintings of Charles R. Knight. By virtue of this relationship with the paleontologists of his time, Knight's paintings were as accurate as science could make them at the time, and this worked its way into the lost world. Delgado's models, all 49 or 50 of them in total, were exact three-dimensional representations of Knight's paintings. The dinosaurs of the Lost World remain to this day the most accurate ever seen in a movie based on what science knew at the time, even more so than was the case with Spielberg's Jurassic Park in 1993, and far more than the recent Jurassic World films. The rogues gallery of dinosaurs established here were destined for stardom, becoming the most famous extinct Mesozoic animals known to the general public. These included Allosaurus, Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, and a threatening three-fingered Tyrannosaurus, who makes short work of any animal that crosses its path. The effects were so groundbreaking for the time that the film became a cultural phenomenon, firmly establishing dinosaurs in popular mass culture. In order to ramp up the finale of the film, Challenger and company managed to capture a Brontosaurus and ship it to London replacing the young pterosaur of the novel with something far grander. However, while being unloaded from the ship, the spooked and disoriented animal escapes and causes havoc until it reaches Tower Bridge, where its massive weight causes the structure to collapse, and it simply swims down the River Thames to an uncertain fate. This scene, like much of the film, would prove to be highly influential on later media, with the escaped rampaging dinosaur providing the blueprint for the destructive actions of both King Kong and Godzilla in the decades to come. Much like their book counterparts, the dinosaurs of the Lost World, and indeed of the early 20th century as a whole, are shown to be lumbering, archaic monstrosities that do little but fight, being creatures to either be tamed or to be subjugated by colonial Europeans reflecting the preoccupations of the Scramble for Africa era in Western history. In the coming decades, Hollywood would double down on this monstrous depiction of dinosaurs, which, after King Kong, became increasingly schlocky and low-budget as time went on. In fact, the time between the two world wars has been described by Robert Bakker as the dinosaur doldrums, with research slowing and scientific opinion stagnating. 
By the 1950s, the great beasts had been reduced to B-movie monsters, children's toys, and symbols of extinction and failure. Charles R. Knight's prehistoric creatures had conquered the world, but had subsequently lost their sense of awe and wonder. However, this video is already long enough as it is, and I'll have to leave further explorations of this topic for another time. Thanks for watching, everyone. The next episode will be covering the Drepanosaurs, some of the strangest reptiles to ever live. See you again soon. Cheerio.